welcome back to another episode of the nonprofit show everyone we're really excited to welcome back one of our faves from bloomerang james golder you know james in the green room we were talking about thanksgiving fall leaves going to the beach all sorts of amazing things but today we brought you in to talk about how volunteers can and i'm going to add should become donors so are you ready my friend i am so ready and so excited this is a great topic and i can't wait to get into it with you good thanks it's a it's a huge topic for me and it's one that um it causes a lot of consternation and we'll get into that but i think that people have like really defined opinions of it that are are kind of sometimes shocking and so i can't wait to hear what you have to say about that um one of the things that we want to make sure that we say something about are our amazing presenting sponsors and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader fundraisers friday and your part-time controller we also have this amazing cadre of co-hosts they come to us from around the country two of our amazing panelists um, have been our residents of florida in different parts i've checked in with one tony bell he is safe and sound uh, meredith terrian who was li who lives and works in tampa um i've not heard back from and so we'll report on that tomorrow i'm anticipating hearing from her today not everybody has their power back um, and this time of the storm throughout the South is putting a lot of stress on our nonprofits. And so we are certainly wishing everyone well and safe work. Um, okay, James, I, I asked you this in the green, green room, but what does a partnerships manager do? <laughs> uh, a lot of different things uh, as it happens. Uh, one of the, the core parts of my job though is forging relationships with what we call national accounts. So think of Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, where there's that national office and then local or regional branches, affiliates, chapters, whatever it is that they call themselves. So my job is to make those connections and keep those relationships moving in the right direction to make sure that we're serving their network appropriately. And uh, yeah, it'd be great to get more customers as well if they feel like that's a good fit for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fascinating because I've got to believe that you have, um, even though you might have chapters that have a national affiliate, no two chapters are probably ever the same, right? Exactly. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Well, we're thrilled that you have all this expertise that you come to us with and this amazing knowledge because this is a topic that is so bizarre to me. Uh, we were talking about this again before we got started, that there are a lot of nonprofits who feel that it is like a sin to associate donors or let me start with volunteers with donors and that you never ask, you never put them in the same database. You, you have different teams that work with the volunteers versus the donors. Sometimes they're in separate parts of your campus. Um, so on the overall concept before we get started is that right or is that wrong so some of the things that i hope that we'll talk about today are why do people volunteer and okay. then we can also look at why do people donate and i think what you'll find when we look at those two things is there's a lot of overlap so if we think about the venn diagram a lot of venn diagram talk right now uh, you'll see that there's a lot of overlap in those two circles because the reason that people volunteer and the reason that people donate are often pretty similar. Uh, and so if you're not appealing to them for both, or at least opening that door and giving them the opportunity, you're missing out on a way to really cement that relationship, whichever way it is that they started that relationship with you in the first place. Okay. I love that you kind of put this under that umbrella because the thing that I want to start off with then is a, this frightening stat that we're not really talking enough about, but that volunteer and donor numbers are down. Giving USA has been reporting on this. Um, why start there? 
So I think it's really important to look at the, the universe that we're dealing with, with both of these two groups. Uh, it shouldn't be super surprising that these numbers are down. I think what has surprised and, and shocked us, uh, me specifically, is how far they're down. Uh, so if we, I know no one wants to do this, but think back with me for just a second. Over the last couple of years, we had the pandemic. Think of 2020, no one knew what was going on. Everything was crazy. We were social distancing, all of that stuff that happened. We kind of stopped doing events, right? Uh, we tried the virtual thing for a little while, it did okay, and then it didn't do okay. And, you know, we again, let's not spend too much time on that because no one wants to remember it, but uh, we tried. Uh, and then, uh, so what happens if you're not having events, right? That's the primary way that a lot of organizations get brand new donors in the door, right? They want to hold those events. They want people to have that emotional connection, to feel that closest and to say, yeah, here's my wallet. Let's go. I love what you guys are doing. I want to support you. Without those events, we saw a huge drop in first-time donors uh, between 2020 and 2023, the last full year that we have data available at this point. Big, big time drops in first-time donors. And why is that a problem? Uh, especially when you look at the dollars that were raised over that same time period, they stayed relatively similar. So is it a big deal that, that the donor count dropped? Well, yeah, it is. I travel all over the country and I talk to all kinds of different conference attendees. And, and the, the, one of the biggest things that everyone is really concerned about lately is donor fatigue. So if the donor universe has dropped, but the dollars have stayed relatively the same, that means we're going back to our major donors and saying, hey, we don't know what's going on. The world is crazy. We need your help. Please, please, please help. And they've said, okay, you got it. No problem. But eventually, and I do think we're starting to see this, they're going to get tired of that and they're going to say, I, uh, I, just, I just need a break. So we've seen that drop. We've seen a drop in volunteers during the same time, which makes a lot of sense. A lot of volunteer programs had to be put on hold or stopped completely. Mm -hmm. And I think what we'll find is that if we stop thinking about these as two separate groups and start thinking about them together, then the donors can help fill the gaps in the volunteers and the volunteers can help fill the gaps in the donors. We just need to think, change the way that we're thinking a little bit. Right. You know, I also would love to know at some point, and this is, this is a topic for another show, but it seems to me that when we hear about these mega donors, that mm -hmm. for the average American, um, it just seems like, what is my $150 going to do? You know, so and so just donated ten million dollars, and right. I don't know how I how my what it's a lot of money to me, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm not one of those people that's going to really be um, having a lot of impact or moving the needle. And so I'm curious at some point to see who studies that to really come down that path, especially when we look at this in relationship to volunteer. Be volunteering because I think you can still feel like you've moved the needle volunteering. Yes. Um, maybe that $150 is like, what is, what is that? What am I doing? That, that means nothing, but going out on a Saturday or doing something. Um, I think there's a little bit more of a sense of value to that. And uh, so I agree with you. There is a lot of donor fatigue for a lot of different reasons. And then I also think too, when we have a general election, that skews things a little bit. I know I read research all the time that says, no, it doesn't really, but um, I don't know. I think, I think it, people I, get nervous. Um, and I, I think to your earlier point uh, or earlier question, I think that we need to do a better job of storytelling. And I, I'm sure we'll get into that a lot more as we go, but yeah. the impact that a $150 gift can make is enormous. It's absolutely enormous, just like the impact that anyone who takes time out of their day, out of their week to go out and volunteer somewhere, that impact can be enormous. Are we communicating that impact to our donors, to our volunteers, to our entire community, or are we not? Because if we're not, um, we're missing some really big opportunities there. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and we are going to uh, spend some time on that. And I'm really... 
I'm interested in learning more about what you think about that. You know, when we think about, we started this conversation about volunteers and donors being two separate groups. A lot of nonprofits structure their organizations and they think this way. So if we have that framework, this is a heavy lift to move an organization forward into a new, a new place, isn't it? Right, it is. Um, so I, I think we need to keep in mind that if we're going to start thinking about these two groups as, as maybe in the same pool, it doesn't mean that we have to change our entire infrastructure around volunteers, for instance. Let's just go with that as an example. So I don't think we need to not have volunteer coordinators and people whose job it is to arrange those schedules and make sure everybody checks in and all of the amazing things that volunteer coordinators do. It's more a focus of communication, I think. Are we communicating to them as separate groups? And if we are, can we, at the very least, uh, have, have some combined communication? Because the stories that we want to tell these people are really pretty similar. So from an efficiency standpoint, it makes a lot of sense from a practical standpoint, but also from what we want out of these relationships with people. So we want to make sure that they're in a fulfilling, engaged relationship with us. And a big part of that is explaining to them what their impact is. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a lot of the studies that are done around volunteers, they they leave and decide not to come back and volunteer for a whole variety of reasons, right? There, there are many, many different reasons. But one of the main reasons is they feel like they're not valued appropriately. Right. So if you look at the IRS, right, the IRS says it's around a volunteer hour is worth around $30 or something like that mm -hmm. for one volunteer hour. There are a lot of volunteers that are going to look at that and they're going to say, well, wait a minute, I, my time's worth more than that. I, if you're reducing my impact to that number, I, mm -hmm. I, I've got better things I can do with my time than that. That's not cool. Yeah. Whereas if you talk about the impact that the organization is going to be able to have because of the hour I spent stuffing envelopes, weeding out in the garden, hanging out with the kids, whatever it is that that volunteer activity is, then all of a sudden it clicks in my brain a little bit and I go, oh yeah, that's okay. That's the impact that I'm having. Yeah. I'm going to keep going back with them. So it, it's not a, you know, it, in my opinion, it's not a matter of changing the infrastructure, changing the way that we're structured or anything like that. It's more, how do we communicate with these groups of people? There's a whole lot of overlap in the kind of stories and those impact that we're trying to share with them. So how can we do that more effectively? I think that's a good way to look at it. I think it's a brilliant way to look at it. And I think that if you go back to that IRS, I think it's like 3250 or something like that an hour. Yep. And I agree with you. I, I think we don't think about that enough because you're right. We're like, wow, that that had not, that didn't pull any, you know, any strings. But I think you're absolutely right to really drill down on what you just did or what that volunteer is is bringing to the table. And so I really appreciate you helping us to understand and call that out. Um, one of the things that you advise us on, and, and I think it's an interesting conversation, is to focus on retention. And that's donors and volunteers. What are we missing here? And why aren't we doing a good enough job on this? So those of you who are familiar at all with Bloomerang know that we are um, obsessed, passionate, passionate sounds better. Let's call it passionate. We're passionate about uh, donor retention. Um, so I've been with Bloomerang now for almost 10 years. And uh, one of the things that we have always looked at is how do we help our users retain more donors? Because it's so much cheaper to retain a donor than it is to go out and get a brand new donor. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If you're holding a big golf tournament or a gala or whatever you're doing, it's a lot of time, money, effort used to pull that off and make everything as amazing as it is and, and then get those people in the door and get them to donate and all that. A lot of time, money, and effort. Whereas with a retained donor, they've already donated to you. 
you know that they already like you, that they love your mission, that they want to impact their community through the work that you are doing. And they see that your organization is one of the best ways that they're able to accomplish that. So it, it's not a lot of convincing with them. Uh, but having said that, if you look at the studies that Adrian Sargent has done and, and other studies over the years about why donors stop donating, most of the time it can be boiled down to poor service or communication. Yeah. So in other words, they just gave you something. Maybe it was $150, maybe it was $5,000, who knows, what, what, whatever it was, they gave you some of their hard-earned money and they want to know what happened after that. What are you going to do with it? How am I impacting my world through your work? So if you're not communicating with them, if you're not updating them with newsletters, if you're not reaching out and calling them, if you're not uh, communicating with them in any of the myriad of ways that you can communicate with donors these days, they're not going to hear about your impact from someone else. Yeah. No one else is going to pick up the phone and say, hey, Julia, check out what the local you know, YMCA just did. This is so cool. That, those phone calls aren't happening. So you've got to do it. You got to pick up the phone, reach out on email, schedule a lunch meeting, whatever it is that, that will work best. Get in front of those donors and let them know, hey, we got your gift. So thankful. So appreciative. Because of that gift, here are the programs that were impacted. This is going to allow us to serve this many more kids or you know, however all of that works. Those are the stories you have to share. So let me ask you this, if, we, if we're not doing this as a sector, and I think we can all agree it's not happening enough, yep. why is that? Do we not know what our impact is? Um, are we, do we not have communication tools? Are we not, are we yep. shy? I mean, what is it, why is there this break? So I think there's a couple of different things, right? Uh, I think, yeah, there is a little shyness there. I, it's it's hard for me as not as a um, as as an employee to brag about the things that I've accomplished, and I've done some good things over the years. But it's hard for me to to give a list to a new boss when they come in and say, "Here are the things that I accomplished last year." And so I think there's some of that that people have to deal with a little bit uh, as they're thinking through these plans. What I would counter that with is if you look at all of the surveys that have been done to ask donors why they keep donating, the number one response almost always is they perceive the organization to be effective. <laughs> How do they know that you're effective? Right, right. The only way they're going to know is if you tell them. Tell them. That's the only way they're going to know. Right. They might happen across a random press release or something like that. And that's amazing and wonderful. And please don't stop putting those out. Do, do all of that that you can. But you have to take control of that, that and get out in front of those donors and let them know all the amazing things that you're accomplishing. Because that's what they want to hear. And then I think you were kind of getting at this also, Julia. The other big piece is we do talk with a lot of organizations that have data, data siloed. So they're using some combination of like PayPal over here for online donations, Excel spreadsheet is their donor database, and then maybe constant contact or MailChimp or something to send newsletters out. And when you have that kind of situation, it can be hard to get data from over here over to here. And, oh, wait, did I forget to put that in this in the MailChimp system? I don't know if I did or not. And it's <laughs> it's just a lot to keep track of and a lot to, to use. So uh, the the think through what that process looks like. If you get a brand new donor, what happens? If you get a volunteer, what happens? How are you communicating with them? What do you have to do to connect those dots and think through how hard that is? Because that can be a big problem as well. You know, I love that you said that because I don't think we spend enough time on, we talk about the donor journey, but we very right. rarely talk about the volunteer journey, do yep. we? And I think that should be mapped out, like what happens A through Z when someone comes through and, and how, how do we navigate that relationship? Um, so important and something that we just completely, we drop the ball on. It's just, it's such a shocking thing that we, um, we do. Um, we have a, a really interesting comment that came in and I'm gonna go ahead and read it uh, before we move on to another, our last topic. 
Um, this, this viewer writes in, volunteers already know who you are, what you do, and have an expressed an interest in helping your organization achieve impact. Why would you not want to ask your volunteers to donate monetarily to your organization? That's like it. Like that's the mindset we need to have, right? A hundred percent. Great comment. And they are a hundred percent correct. These both groups, right? Volunteers, donors want to impact their community. They want to make a difference in their world, wherever it is that their world is. And they've said, this organization, that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it through volunteering, giving my time or giving my money. Uh, and why wouldn't they want to do both if they're able to? Uh, right. If they're able, ask them and, and they'll have a great conversation with them. That's a, a wonderful comment, 100% correct. Yeah, I love that. And I just it just seems to me, James, that that's like the mindset that you, you need to share with everyone on the team um, yeah. throughout the organization, because there are going to be a lot of people where this is a, a somewhat controversial thought, you know, yeah. that, that they'll be like, oh, no, we don't do that. You can't do that. And uh, yeah, that's just not a, a, a good thing. Um, one of the things you started off with, and I want to end with it, is that storytelling is a tool based on, on how we can look at this. And I'd love to, to spend the, the last 10 minutes or so that we have with you kind of examining what this could be. It's such an important part of uh, effectively communicating the impact that you're having. So uh, I th there are several elements to a, a successful story, right? Uh, you've got character, you've got some sort of, uh, you know, adverse situation, a challenge, something like that. You've got change over time. Uh, so there are if you think back to a TV show that you love or one of those books that you're reading and it's two in the morning and you can't put it down and you know you got to get up in a few hours, but I have to find out what's going on with these people. It's usually because of character, right? right. So I always like to caveat this whenever I talk about this. Please, please, please <clears throat> think through very carefully and purposefully any sort of privacy concerns or anything like that that you need to be aware of. Please be very careful about that. Right. Having said that, character is what draws people in to a story. So the example I always use is uh, our oldest daughter uh, lives in Chicago, takes the uh, L train to work every day. It's like 40 minutes each way or whatever it is. So Larissa reads a lot. And normally when I say, oh, my child reads a lot. They're like, oh, you know, 50 books a year. No, last year she read like 160 or something. Yeah. She reads a lot. I read a lot. I don't read that many, but I, I read a lot. And she and I share book recommendations back and forth. So maybe once a quarter, uh, one of us will send a text to the other and say, hey, you should check this out. It's really good. And it got me thinking because we read a lot of books between the two of us, like a lot, but we only share maybe 10 a year, maybe. And why, why don't we share more? So there's a lot that we read and we probably enjoyed and said, yeah, that was, that was good. But that we didn't feel like the other one really should read that. And I do think that it comes down to character. When you are emotionally invested in that story, you have to find out what happens next. Uh, you're just completely gripped and can't put it down. Yes, there's usually some sort of adverse situation, a challenge the characters are facing, there's a change over time, there's a goal, all of that is happening, but it's characters. It's those characters mm -hmm. that really pull you in. So as you all are thinking through, how do we communicate the impact that we're having to our donors and to our volunteers and then just to our community at large? Right. Think about including those characters. That's gonna really resonate with people if you're serving a young person who uh, you know is food insecure let's say but because of the work that you're doing they are getting fed at school and then there's an after school program that they're going to go to and because of that lessening of the food insecurity they're able to study more effectively they get better grades in school they are able to go to clubs and interact better with their peers all of the amazing things that happen with that tell yeah. that sort of a story because your donors and your volunteers love to hear that. That's why they're with you. That's why they're supporting you monetarily and or with their time. 
tell them those kinds of stories because it's going to really cement in why they're doing that and why they're with you. And it'll help them to keep coming back. They're going to want to keep donating at both time and money, which is a win for everyone. You know, James, we do that a lot in boards. Sometimes we call it the mission moment, um, where we start a board meeting with um, a, a situation that somebody witnessed, or if we're very fortunate, a client can come in and talk. Um, and it's used to reframe the board experience, right? To get vo board volunteers to say, I'm going to give it my all, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be present because this is why this is how important this work is. And I am fascinated by how oftentimes we don't use that any other place, but in the board meeting, Yep. you know, it's like, ah, it's such a great tool and it's meaningful. If, if you think about an event, right? Let's say you have an auction gala, some combination. What, what, happens a lot of times at those events we have so, you know maybe the ed stands up and talks through some impact numbers you know how many people we reached last year and so on and so forth all of those things please keep doing that that that's great that's really helpful um and sometimes not all the time but sometimes we have a testimonial we have a service recipient we have someone stand up and give that brief hopefully heartfelt communication with the audience where if you're sitting in the audience, you go, oh, 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 this just became really real for me. Yeah. All of a sudden it moved from those numbers, which are really important. I don't want to downplay those, but move from the abstract to, oh, really concrete, because now I'm hearing from this person specifically how their life was changed or how their kids' lives were changed or whatever that story is. That's enormously impactful. So yeah, why do we only do that at board meetings or at events when we could uh, record videos uh, of people, uh, type their stories up and send them out in newsletters? Uh, there are all kinds of things that we could do to get those impacts out into our community, which would resonate incredibly well with the folks who love us and want to support us. It's a great idea. Well, and I think James, to your point, um, and I know Bloomerang talks about this a lot, but you do, you don't just do something once, you know, you, you do something well and you figure it out and then you, you place it in many play in many parts of your organization from yes. your social media to your website, to your monthly newsletter, um, public speaking. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And so, yeah, it's something we need to kind of refocus ourselves on. When you find those stories that resonate with people, figure out how to get them in front of people as many different ways as you can, yeah. across different channels, different formats. When you find that story, that, and, and one of my favorites is I, I went with our youngest uh, child to uh, on a field trip one time, right? We went to a farm uh, and Sunny dug in the dirt and, and planted, uh, I think, beet seeds, if I remember right. Uh, and, and I'd never had beets before, uh, not something I have growing up, uh, but we, she, she planted the beet seeds and then she went back and she weeded around, you know, and then went back a couple weeks after that and, and weeded some more and watered and watched the progression, right? And these beet plants would grow until finally it was time to harvest them. And then she harvested them and she brought them back to our house and we had beets. And I had to look online to figure out how you make beets because I uh, it wasn't something I had. Uh, but I figured it out and we made beets and now we eat beets right, fairly right. regularly. Well, that's a really cool story about an mm -hmm. entire family and a small child that kind of mm -hmm. grew to really like vegetables and eat better and more healthy. And think about what you can do with that kind of story. When you find that story in your uh, impact, uh, in the areas that you're impacting in your community, go with it figure out how to get that story in front of people because it's inspirational and people are going to want to join up and help you. I love it, James. Well, you are a great story yourself um, being with Bloomerang uh, for a decade. And uh, I always value your time on the nonprofit show. I think you, you make things uh, very achievable, logical and achievable, which are, is, is hard. So sometimes it'll be like, well, yeah, that's a great idea, but who can do it? You know what I mean? 
But right. you always bring uh, to the nonprofit show and to our viewers and listeners really strong, actionable items. And so this is amazing. And, and I really appreciate it. Um, you know, you can connect with James on LinkedIn. You can learn more about he and his team and the work that uh, Bloomerang does at bloomerang.com. One of the amazing things about this organization is they do a lot of research. They bring in a lot of thought leaders and there's no charge for access to this information. Um, do they want you to be one of their clients? You bet. But you can get amazing information and training. I'm just going to call it out for training, uh, James, through bloomerang.com. So definitely check them out. They have been an, an amazing partner of ours since the get go. And uh, James, what a great, great conversation. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Always enjoy it. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Hey, another thing that we want to make sure is that we want to extend our gratitude to all of our partners. And James comes to us from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staff and Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episode on Fridays, just dedicated to fundraisers and all the things that they have to deal with and your part-time controller. Um, James, you probably remember this, but as we end each and every episode, we end with this mantra, this wisdom, this wish, and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. See you back here tomorrow, everyone.